Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we're going to talk about what it takes to get a museum ship. This is uh, something that we've been asked time and time again. First uh, things first, there are hundreds of museum ships out there. How did they come to be? Um, the most historic ships often are not the ones that are saved. Sometimes ships get saved for really weird and unique reasons, and they're not necessarily uh, significant for any reason other than being old. Uh, in other cases, it may be this submarine isn't the most significant submarine, but the most significant ones are gone, and this is the one we have. Just because a ship is historically significant does not mean it will be saved as a museum. Just ask the aircraft carrier Enterprise. Either one of them. When the Navy decommissions a ship, one of several possibilities for disposal is turning into a museum ship. And when I say disposal, I mean disposal. The Navy is getting rid of these vessels. They will not support them in any way. So museum ships do not get money from the Navy or the federal government as a rule. They are not going to get any support there. So when you take over a museum ship, you have to have the capacity to maintain it, which is something normally only capable of being done by the federal government. That's one thing to keep in mind here. So uh, it's one of several possible means of disposal. In some cases, ships are scrapped outright. In some cases, they're used in sink -ex exercises. Uh, in some cases, they're sold to foreign militaries. Uh, if a ship is slated for foreign military sale or to be used in a sink -ex, you're probably not going to be able to get it as a museum ship. And we do not have museum ship examples of all of the different types of ships that have ever existed. Uh, so we've got Fletcher class destroyers, we've got Sumner class destroyers, we've got Gearing class destroyers. Uh, we don't have any Mitcher class destroyers. We do have some Forrest Sherman, Charles Adams class destroyers, but then we don't have any more modern and we don't have any less modern than a Fletcher. There's no four stack destroyers. There's none of the inner war gold platers. So simply because a ship is a class that hasn't been saved doesn't necessarily make it historically significant enough to save. By the same token, if, for example, the ship you want to turn into a museum is not being put on reserve status to be used as a museum, it doesn't mean you'll never get it. A couple of museum ships were sold to foreign countries, used overseas for a number of years, and then when they were decommissioned, they were acquired uh, to be turned into museums. So that is a completely separate process from what we're talking about for most of the rest of this video. But um, I'll talk through that briefly. Basically, if you want a museum ship from a foreign country, and uh, Slater is the example that jumps to the front of my head right away. That destroyer escort was used by the US Navy during World War II and sold to Greece. And it was used by the Greek Navy up until uh, the late 80s or early 90s. And then a number of destroyer escort sailors uh, went over to Greece, worked with the Greek government, and brought that ship back to the United States to be turned into a museum. So, the restrictions placed on that ship by the Greek government are very different from the restrictions placed on museum ships like Battleship New Jersey by the federal government. Uh, so like I said earlier, these ships are not owned by the Navy anymore. The Navy doesn't give us a thin dime, but that doesn't mean they can't tell us what to do. So different museum ships have different donation agreements from the Navy. The earlier museum ships have pretty loose agreements. Here is this ship, display it as a museum. Uh, and then ships, as you get into the 2000s, where the Iowa-class battleships are all turned into museums, uh, and really the Iowas are some of the most recent museum ships created. They were mostly opened in the uh, first decade of the 21st century. And I can't think of too many museum ships that have been opened since then. Uh, since Battleship Iowa herself was opened around 2012. So it, it's not like new museum ships are popping up every day or new ships are available for this every day. Donation agreements got more restrictive as time went on. Like I said, early on, the first museum ships, here's a ship. Well, over time, that ship continues to deteriorate. That's kind of a no-brainer. 
Uh, some museums are able to deal with that deterioration and some of them uh, are so old or are getting low enough visitation that they are not able to keep up with it. Uh, so these older museum ships, uh, some of them started to fail. The uh, staff that was working on them aged out or the uh, material condition deteriorated to the point that the ship was closed uh, either by their staff or by their local governments because it becomes hazardous to use them. Uh, the submarine Ling is the example that, that jumps to mind. That boat received damages in a storm. Their staff was unable to take care of the ship anymore and uh, the museum closed and it still has not been able to reopen. So there, there are a couple of other examples of this. Some ships like Cabot uh, were never able to be opened. Uh, other ones get to this point and operate for a couple of years and then end up closing down. Uh, and now there is a old boat in a river leaking hydraulic fluid and oil and all sorts of nasty stuff into the Hackensack River. So whose responsibility is it? The Navy considered it final disposition when they got rid of the museum ships. So they don't want to have to have the ship come back and spend money to tow it, dredge it out, get it under the bridge, uh, so to speak. So how do you, uh, they, they don't have money in the budget for that. They don't have all the ships they want on active service. They can't spend money on these ships that they thought they had gotten rid of. And so the restrictions get more strict. Uh, and so we've, we've had a number of people comment about how, well, you own the ship, that they can't put restrictions on it. That's not true. I own my car, but I still have to get license plates on it. You have to wear a seat belt. You have to follow the speed limits. You have to stop at stop signs. So just because you own it doesn't mean that they aren't telling you what to do with it. And it's the same case with a museum ship. So there is a link to a video we previously did on our Navy contract if you would like to look more on what that entails. Uh, and in that video, there are also links to some other Navy contracts, including Iowa's, which is the most recent and therefore the most stringent. So you can get an idea of, uh, hey, I'm interested in opening a museum ship. What are some things to think about? There is a ship slated for final disposal that you think is historically significant and you want to save it as a museum ship. You're not willing to wait for it to be sold to a foreign country so you can get it with less strings attached later. The first thing you have to do is form a nonprofit that's going to take possession of this ship if you can get through the process. Uh, once you have form this nonprofit, going through all the government hoops that that entails, uh, you can start collecting donations and uh, raising interest in this idea. You have to show that there is interest. Once you are able to demonstrate a certain amount of interest, go to the Navy and request that the vessel be placed on donation hold. There are currently zero vessels on donation hold. NAVC is the group that oversees the final disposition of vessels, uh, including them while they're in the reserve fleet and mothballs, and then when they're being scrapped or foreign sales or whatever the case may be, or whatever the case may be. If you uh, go to them with a compelling proposal, they may give you access to the vessel so you can survey it, see what condition it is in, if it is, if there's actually potential to save it, if it's got all of the internal equipment that it would need to be displayed. Uh, and at that point, if you're able to move forward with the process, they may place the vessel on donation hold. Donation hold is a temporary status. Uh, oftentimes it is only granted for a single year, although sometimes there are multi-year instances, but plan on getting everything together in a single year. You have to, uh, basically write up a full proposal at this point. You're going to have to get some sort of local government on board to have a museum ship in their district. And uh, museum ships are great ways to raise commerce in uh, an area, but they don't do that on their own. So you've got to work with a local government organization of some sort to do this. Uh, you will need their help and their lobbying effort. The Navy will ask for a whole series of things. You have to be able to show that you can raise money to maintain the ship so it doesn't end up returning to them. Uh, so fundraising will be critical. It's very difficult to fundraise for a museum ship. 
Remember, you're competing with feeding homeless children and other things like that that are compelling things to donate to for broad sections of the population. Yet many people would not consider museumships an urgent need uh, for them to donate money to as opposed to feeding homeless children or homeless veterans or, you know, just, just examples. There's all sorts of things that people can donate money to. There are those dogs on the TV with the sad eyes. Like, museum ships don't have sad eyes. In the arms of a curator. So, like, how, how do you compete with that? You've got to show that you've got the ability to do that. Uh, ships, like battleships that are named after states, you, you can tend to get the whole state's support, but uh, maybe even cruisers named after cities, although there's a very small number of them that survive, so maybe not. Uh, so really has to be a ship that people find compelling for some reason. And that's really difficult in the modern age when most ships are named after Civil War battles or dead presidents or uh, individuals as opposed to New Jersey. So th this ship was saved because the bulk of the state, including the state government, put its weight behind preserving her on top of uh, an impeccable wartime record throughout much of the 20th century. Yeah. In some instances, like with Battleship New Jersey, her war record was so compelling that there were multiple organizations uh, created to bring the ship back. These started in the middle of the 20th century when the ship was still in service and uh, continued each time she was decommissioned after Korea, Vietnam, uh, and finally into the 80s. Uh, and when she was finally decommissioned for the last time in the 90s, at least two separate groups in the state of New Jersey were competing for her uh, with legitimate uh, applications. There were probably even more groups that uh, thought about getting her. So sometimes ships are too historically significant and you might have to compete. Battleship Missouri, uh, a group in Bremerton, Washington, where she was home ported for a number of years in mothballs, and the group in Pearl Harbor were both competing for that vessel. She was undoubtedly historically significant. Uh, other ships, groups tried to uh, acquire, such as the aircraft carrier Saratoga, and they were never able to get enough support despite that ship's record. And so she ended up being scrapped in the end. So you have a very short period of time to put together a full proposal saying that this local government is going to let me dock my ship here, and here is a dock that we're going to use, and it's got a uh, we're going to build a ticketing booth here, and we've got the money to do that, and we're going to put the ship here. Uh, we are going to put in place infrastructure to power and water the ship. We're going to put a 100-year storm system in so that if, if a 100-year storm blows up, it's not going to drag the ship down the river uh, and, and cause damages. We have to be able to have a certain amount of insurance so the Navy specifically says you need X amount of insurance, just day-to-day -day operations. Uh, and you should have more than that, but this is the minimum we'll let you use. And you have to have more insurance every time you tow the ship and towing plans have to be submitted and all of that. And the, that cost is going to be on you, not on the U.S. Navy. You might have to dredge a berth to get your ship in here. Uh, you may have to dry dock your ship before it's open to the public. There will undoubtedly be maintenance work that needs to be done. So you need a tremendous amount of money up front before you ever open your doors and are able to start taking uh, money from tickets. You've got a very short period of time to garner all of this support. And quite honestly, the Navy's requirements nowadays are so strict and so high that uh, we're not gonna see too many museum ships open. Uh, that's a good thing because there are already so many museum ships. Where do you put a new one? You you put another one in, say, the New York area. You're competing with how many other museums around there? You've got the Brig Niagara in Erie. You've got Slater in Albany. Uh, in New York City, you've got Intrepid and the South Street Seaport, and both of those are multi-ship museums. And there's probably some other ones I'm not even thinking of off the top of my head. Other coastal states like California 
and the Gulf states, a lot of the uh, mid-Atlantic states have museum ships. Uh, and so even here in the Camden, Philadelphia area, we've got the Battleship New Jersey, we've got uh, the Cruiser Olympia, the Submarine Bakuna, and a couple of other non-warships uh, that are all operating as museum vessels. Uh, and we've got the SS United States, which is trying to establish itself as a museum. So there, there is a tremendous amount of competition here. And we're not just comp competing with each other. The, how many museums are there in Philadelphia? You've got art museums and science museums and history museums, uh, all trying to compete with tourist dollars that, uh, yeah, there's, well, I don't know, 65 million people who come to Philadelphia every year, but they're going to the Liberty Bell and they're going to Independence Hall and they're going to all these other places. Um, so then they have to decide on the fourth or fifth day of my trip, do I want to go see the battleship or do I want to go see the Olympia? Like you can't put too many of these ships too close. Not having any more museum ships is a bad thing though, because there will continue to be historically significant ships and ships that are examples of, uh, important time periods and important architectural uh, designs and uh, any, any number of reasons why it's important to preserve historic structures. So uh, I'm not saying there should never be another museum ship added. There, there are reasons not to add more and there are absolutely reasons why we should save historically significant examples of other ships. Uh, we've done another video not too long ago about different uh, ships that I thought should have been saved as museums. And uh, we'll probably do other videos in the future on similar topics. So I absolutely believe that there should be other museum ships created. Uh, just th there are reasons that it's difficult. Maybe you're not just a concerned citizen who wants to preserve a ship. Maybe you are on city government somewhere and you think that a museum ship would be great for your area. Uh, th there are probably still places in this country and certainly worldwide. I, I should stop and say the United States has way more museum ships than anywhere else. Uh, there are plenty of rooms in other countries for museum ships. Uh, there, there are a number of overseas museum ships generically, but in terms of how many French museum ships are there or how many uh, Japanese museum ships are there, these, these were huge maritime powers at one point or another. Do they have huge museum ship collections? Not particularly. They've, they've got a couple of ships. So there, there's certainly room for museum ships in different places around the world and even in the United States. Uh, so you want to bring one to your town because you think it's going to be good for the economy. Well, again, you, you've got to go through the Navy. The... Uh, Let's say a group has defaulted on their museum ship and you want to bring it to your area. Um, Jacksonville, Florida has been trying to get a museum ship for probably a decade now off the top of my head. And they've tried to get a ship that was still uh, at the Navy Yard. They've tried to get uh, ships that have operated as a museum before. So you, you've got to go through all the same steps and show that, hey, we've got the infrastructure for it here. We've got the support for it. We've got the money. It always comes down to the money. And uh, they, they still haven't been able to get that ship, even though they've put a tremendous amount of work in for a number of different vessels. So that they're still struggling to fill in uh, the Navy's requirements. Moving a ship, uh, transferring ownership of a ship, requires you to go through and do this same uh, process as if you were getting a ship from them brand new. So another way you can acquire uh, a museum ship, or I should say boat really, uh, some smaller vessels will go on private sale when they're out of uh, military service. And this is quite common with Coast Guard cutters in particular. But uh, some smaller Navy ships will also go through this. And like uh, you can go online and buy surplus military equipment. You can even buy surplus military Humvees or boats. Um, and, and so some people have acquired uh, smaller boats uh, and Coast Guard cutters and uh, vessels like that. And uh, 
with the intention of opening them up as a museum. Not just anyone can get a vessel and decide to operate it, uh, whether you're using it commercially to transport passengers or take fishers out uh, for day cruises or scuba divers or whatnot. And the same goes for getting a vessel like this and operating it as a museum. You need an industry expert to show you how to operate a museum. Uh, I talk about a bunch of guys with a boat all the time. Uh, there are plenty of organizations out there that are not really museums. There are a bunch of guys with a boat. And the boat is a clubhouse that uh, they use. And to pay for maintaining their clubhouse, they open it up to the public and the public can come in and see some spaces. These organizations are some of the uh, least financially solvent options. And when that group of individuals is no longer able to care for those boats, whether they age out or there's a money problem because a storm hit them and they uh, no longer able to keep their boat open, uh, suddenly it becomes an issue. In that situation, really the only thing to do is get rid of the boat. Uh, it, it has proven that it cannot operate as a museum and uh, you're not going to find any success trying to find somebody who is successful operating a museum ship to take over a failed museum ship in addition to the one they have. Multiple museum ships do not bring more guests. So you're adding more cost without getting more money for it. So I don't believe there would be much success with creating a multi-ship museum out of a viable museum ship and one that's proven to not be viable. So uh, this video was very much in response to your questions. Feel free to leave us any questions down below in the comment section and let us know uh, what you still don't understand the process. We'll probably do more videos going forward, uh, maybe talking about how museum ships operate in their first couple of years after they have successfully gotten a vessel. Uh, and other more museum related topics. We've got a whole playlist of museum related topics to look through if you're interested in that sort of thing, in addition to the military history and whatnot. I know I'm interested in that. So uh, keep leaving us questions. Let us know what you don't understand about how museum ships work. Um, heck, you might think you understand how museum ships work and be completely off the mark. And hopefully these videos will correct you there. Like many people think that we are still an active commissioned Navy ship that the Navy pays for. And uh, that is true for a very, very small number of museum ships. The submarine Nautilus and the uh, frigate Constitution are the only two that come to mind. Uh, in particular, battleships like Missouri that are on the Pearl Harbor Navy base or uh, the destroyer Turner Joy, which is near the Puget Sound Navy Yard, but not on it. Uh, people say are funded by the government, but they are private nonprofits, just like Battleship New Jersey, with a staff of folks just like myself uh, working on them. They, they do not get government funding unless they're able to earn grants. All of that said, Battleship New Jersey does receive operating support from the New Jersey Department of State. Uh, this comes in the form of operating grants. Uh, we also receive support from a number of businesses and individuals like yourselves. And the donations that you guys leave us uh, allow us to make this a large part of our job. So there's a link in the description below uh, to a place you can donate to uh, help us make more of these videos going forward. Another way you can support us is by liking, sharing, and subscribing. And that'll let other people know we're making these videos. And it'll let uh, you know every time we release a new video so that uh, you know five times a week when our content's coming out. Thanks for watching.